Good evening all, and welcome to the first episode of the Mortis Media Podcast. We're going to be going for a walk in the woods tonight, where I'm sure we will encounter many strange, terrifying, and horrific things. I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was almost killed six years ago by a friend, and it dabbles into the paranormal at times. This took years for me to be able to talk about. I'm still dealing with PTSD associated with the event. Six years ago, myself and a male friend called Sam decided we wanted to go camping. I'd known him for years and he was one of my best friends. So I wasn't weirded out by going camping alone with him, but I decided to invite a girlfriend along, the more the merrier, Rita. So we decided to go camping at this spot. I hadn't been to that particular one in a couple of years, but I still remembered the basic general directions to get there. We stopped at a gas station outside the last tiny town and asked to make sure we were going the right way, to which the attendant pointed and said, follow the storm. And sure enough, huge black clouds are formed in the direction of our campsite. I mean, this was, to date, the most terrifying storm that I had ever seen. What's a story without a crazy storm, right? So we sit in the car and discuss going home, But being the badasses that we are, we decide to tough it out. We all like camping in the rain during storms. Now, we start driving on this dirt road in the middle of nowhere. And as we're getting closer to the campsite, I start getting this horrible feeling. Just horrible. There's no way to explain it. Other than I knew something bad was going to happen. We eventually decide to turn around, because the storm was that bad. The lightning was hitting right outside our car, and it seemed way too dangerous. So we start heading back towards town, and the second we leave the forest, boom, no storm. Okay, well if the storm is localised in this area, we'll go camp elsewhere. About 20 minutes from our town, there is a reservoir with a man-made lake and a few camping spots in various spots. So we park there, pick up our stuff, and start on the trail that runs around the lake so that we can find a spot with more privacy. The spot where we parked our car was right at the opening of the trail, and a couple of cars were camped at the spot right there. We stopped and chatted casually with them. They seemed pretty cool, so we invited them to head out our way in about an hour, after we'd set up shop and we'd all play games and drink together. We get to our spot and set up camp, and I randomly get a text message on my phone from another friend. This was weird because cell service is super shoddy out in this area. She is an artist friend of mine, whose stars have risen greatly in the last few years. I explain where we are, and she says, Great, I've been looking for a really big fire recently. I'm on my way. Kind of an odd statement, but artists are strange people, and she smokes a lot of weed. So I don't really understand half of what she says. So, let's fast forward time here for the sake of the story. We are having a great time. The other couples come over and we're drinking and having a blast. And my artist friend shows up with this monstrosity of a statue. She said that she made it in her college freshman art class and it brought her horribly bad luck for four years and she wants to burn it. I wish to God I had some sort of bad feeling about it, but I'm not really one to believe in supernatural or weird things. So we all laugh and throw it in the fire. 
Fast forward a couple of hours. My artist friend brought her weed out and smoked with my friend Sam for a few hours. Now Sam is mixing liquor and weed. Rita and I don't smoke, and it starts getting dark. And the new couple heads towards their camp, and my artist friend decides to head home, as she was not planning to spend the night. So, it was just the original trio left. At about this time, Sam is starting to act very weird. We laughed it off as cross faded, which nearly cost me my life. It started off with his voice changing. It went from normal to very low, dark, and gravelly. He sounded like a totally different person. Once again, we just think that he's a bit screwed up. Then it gets worse. He starts babbling nonsense. It started off pretty quietly, but got more and more understandable. He pulled Rita aside and told her he worked for the CIA, had millions of dollars in offshore accounts, and could make any of us disappear in an instant and get away with it with no issue. Please keep in mind, this is one of my absolute best friends, and I've never felt the least bit scared around him. We just laugh off the veiled threats. Haha, <laughs> okay, drunk ass. Around this time, Rita notices that her hatching that we were using for firewood had gone missing. We searched everywhere, but it was just too dark. We give it up as a lost cause until sunup. Sam is still muttering dark nonsense to himself, sitting on the opposite side of the fire pit alone. Eventually he passed out, and Rita and I stayed up chuckling about how weird he'd acted, and congratulated ourselves on a pretty fun night. About an hour later, we start to feel raindrops and the damn storm we'd driven to avoid is getting ready to dump on our heads. Oh well, it's late. We'll get drunky in the tent and go to bed. This is where it gets real. We shake him gently until he moans and we explain that it's starting to rain and that it's time to get to bed. He struggles up and Rita and I each grab a side and haul him in the tent. We stop in front of the tent to unzip it, and he goes nuts. Totally out of this world, possessed by the devil himself. I'm not even being dramatic about this. He starts screaming this horrible high-pitched sound. One, I'll never be able to get out of my nightmares. I was bent over, so I missed the swing that Rita gets thrown to the other side of the camp. He turns around. Gracefully, I might add. Driven stupor gradually gone, and kicks out the last coals from the fire. This is happening in a matter of seconds, but time was slowed down for me. I remember every tiny detail. So the fire is out, the campsite is a hundred percent pitch black. No moon because of the storm clouds. Next thing I know, Sam is standing next to me, so close I can feel him breathing, and then all of a sudden I'm on the ground. I hit hard enough for the air to be knocked out of me. Not that I'd be able to breathe anyway, because Sam was sitting on my stomach, with his hands wrapped very tightly around my throat. He was strangling me with all of his very significant strength. Now Sam is one of those super tall muscular types that have crazy long monkey arms. I'm reaching up to try and push him off me as his arms were so long that I couldn't even touch his chest. I was scraping at his arms and bucking underneath him, trying to get him off me. I can hear Rita screaming my name, trying to find out where I am, but at this point I'm blacking out. It seemed like an eternity. But in reality, it was probably no more than a few minutes. Through my fading vision, I see Rita, 
punching and fighting Sam, trying her hardest to get him to let go. She's a rugby player, so she's pretty scrappy. I black out for a few minutes. I only have Rita's version of the story. But after I go limp, she understandably freaks out and assumes that he's killed me. She goes into overdrive and starts kneeing him in the face. Eventually, she hits him enough times to stun him enough to make him let go. And she pushes him aside and hauls me up, still unconscious, and seriously thought I was dead. And dead weight is no easy thing. Go, Rita. I guess I was out for a couple of minutes. But when I come to, she's dragging me down the path, crying quietly. I come to pretty much full force, and am immediately on freak-out mode. Hysterics, naturally. Screaming, crying, shaking uncontrollably. And Rita is telling me to hush. That Sam hadn't followed us, but we certainly didn't want him to start. I managed to control myself a little, and I managed to start carrying my own weight to walk. Now, to add insult to injury, my flip-flops had fallen off during the attack, and I was now walking barefoot on a horribly rocky path. This was not pleasant, and I could feel the cuts. So Rita, being the badass she is, takes off her sandals and puts them on my feet. Seriously, this girl, Jesus. So, from our campsite to the parking lot was about 15 minutes but probably longer with my recent trauma. But it was still silent behind us. So, it seemed that Sam had been left behind. When we were close enough to the new couple's camp, which was right behind the parking lot, we started screaming for help. The girl, being reasonably frightened, stays in the tent. But the guy comes out to the path to find out what was wrong. We explain the whole attack slash almost died situation, and he pulls out a gun with the intention of walking back to our campsite. Luckily, his girlfriend comes out at this point and convinces him that instead of a murder charge, it would be better instead to get us to cell service so that we can dial 911. We're walking towards their car when we realize there's a camp manager a couple of hundred yards away. Perfect. We head towards that knock on the door, cry hysterically, and explain what was going on. A very nice lady gets us bottles of water while her husband calls the police. They sit us down on their couch to wait, and for some reason, I still remember seeing that there were five deadbolts on the door. He wasn't getting through that door. About half an hour later, about a dozen cops and an ambulance are there. The cops take our story and head up to find Sam, asking us if he's armed. We say that we didn't know. They explain the missing hatchet, and my knife in the purse. So they go out armed. Rita and I are loaded into the ambulance, and an officer comes to the door before it closes, and state that they found Sam. He was still at the campsite, completely naked, bleeding from the minor wounds Rita had inflicted, holding the hatchet, and laughing. The officer said he was mumbling about being possessed by the devil and spouting utter nonsense. The officer asked if he had done any drugs, and we'd said that he'd smoked weed and drank. Could the weed have been laced? I doubt it. My artist friend didn't become possessed by Satan that night. The rest is fairly dull. My first ever ambulance ride. A very pricey emergency visit. A lot of drugs. CT scans to check for internal swelling in my neck, and they wanted to keep me overnight, but there was no way I was going to let that happen. My cat is my therapy animal, and he was home. I was going home. End of story. To add insult to injury. When I got home, I realised that because I'd been having roommate troubles, I'd locked my bedroom door with my cat inside, and my keys were still at the campsite. I could hear him meowing through the door while I just soaked my eyes out. Locked on the outside. I was too loaded up on drugs to go anywhere. So Rita, in a final spur of awesomeness, went with her mother 
who worked with abused women and helped me through many a panic attack after, went out and retrieved all my stuff. All of us are at 24 hours of no sleep. That's the story. The rest is just obvious stuff. Charges, prosecution, court, and a lot of physical and mental anguish. He pleaded guilty. The judge asked him if he wanted to make a statement. He didn't. I never got an apology for almost ending my life. Sometimes there's no definite closure. I never believed in bad luck, superstition, possession, or any of that stuff. But I am 100% positive burning that stupid statue is what caused him to snap that night. He wasn't a dangerous person. He never had been violent before. The statue did something. It brought my artist friend bad luck and clearly had some bad spirit in it that we let go. That's the most detailed account that I've ever given about this incident. I grew up in the Great Pacific Northwest, in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, under the shadow of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. It is a land full of myth and legend, mostly from the natives, but a lot from the old timers, the loggers, the trappers and hunters. One of my father's oldest and dearest friends now passed on was a local Native American who was one of the oldest of his nation. He was an adult before most of the towns in the area were settled by white people. His name was Charlie to us. I'm sure he had another native name, but I don't recall what it was. Charlie used to sit us down, kids and adults, and tell us stories. Some of the stories were tribal legends, some of them were things he swore happened to him in the woods, and some of the things said by the other men and women of his tribe were the fur trappers and miners of the late 19th century. As I got older, I began to realize that Charlie wasn't pulling our legs on some of these stories. He genuinely believed them. And a few of them happened to me, as I would wander out into the woods and investigate. The most obvious and easiest to prove was the ridge light or mountain lights. Charlie called them by different names, and the locals to this day still tell some of the stories about them. The lights, according to Charlie, had existed as far back as man had. They would appear around the mountains on clear nights and zip around in the air. One of the local legends said that the lights were the spirits dancing and playing. I first saw the lights when I was a kid, and several times since then. To me, they fit the exact description of a classic UFO. Lights that appear to be some form of aircraft that flew in manners impossible for current aircrafts, incredible speeds, and course corrections. The last time I saw the ridge lights was in the mid 90s. I have noticed a distant decrease in reported sightings of them since then. But for a while, the western foothills of the Cascades were a hotspot for UFO sightings. Speaking of UFOs, it goes on a bit further than just seeing the lights. When I was a young kid, I woke up in the middle of the night in the little farmhouse we lived in to bright lights outside. They were multicolored and flashing, like police cars, except I seemed to recall they were green as well. I curiously and unafraid walked out of my room and into the living room, the kitchen, and eventually my parents' room. All the while in all the windows, there were these bright lights. I tried to wake my parents up, but they were sound asleep. I shrugged it off and went to bed and woke up in the morning. When I brought it up with my parents, they dismissed it as a dream. I accepted that, especially because one odd part of my story, I couldn't wake my father up. 
and he was a Vietnam vet who normally woke up at the sound of a mosquito farting. This story would have ended there, if not for our drunken neighbour. Some years later, when I was a teen, I was talking with the now dead neighbour's granddaughter. The neighbour himself was known as a drunken lout and storyteller of the First Order. Anyway, his granddaughter was telling me about how he used to tell these crazy stories, and one day, he swore up and down that aliens landed in his field and visited him in the middle of the night. I laughed and said, I think I would have seen that, as our yard is connected to his field. She agreed, saying something like, You and your parents would have noticed a bunch of red, green and blue and white flashing lights in your backyard ten years ago. To be clear, I am not saying I saw a UFO land near my house. I'm saying... I have seen lights that match the description of the lights on the supposed spaceship reporting to have landed in my unreliable, drunken neighbour's yard. And then, there's the big myth of them all. Sasquatch. Bigfoot. Whatever you call him. Do I believe he exists? Absolutely. Even though I consider myself a man who puts science before superstition. Why do I believe in him? Because when I was a child, I saw the footprints. My father even had a plaster cast of one. That was my first encounter. The prints were on the edge of a bed creek, in a small ravine on a piece of wild property my father owned. We found them when surveying the property with a hunter friend. My father insisted it must be Bigfoot, to which the hunter scoffed, and said a man could have made those prints. To demonstrate, this six foot six, 250 pound hunter climbed on a nearby log, took off his boots, and jumped down into the semi soft ground. His foot size was 12, and made about a half an inch indent into the earth next to the other print. The print was a hand longer than the hunter's, and at least one and a half inches down. It also had an odd big toe. It was splayed to the side, kind of like a thumb. My dad consulted Charlie for advice. Charlie told him to leave Sasquatch be, and Sasquatch would leave us be. Charlie also told us how he knew when Sasquatch was nearby. Nothing else would be, and sometimes you could smell him. He said that if you could smell Sasquatch, it was time to get the hell out because he was a hell of a lot closer than you wanted him to be. Anyway, as the years went by, we learned to just hike out of the woods if they got dead quiet and we didn't see any signs of other animals. Only twice do I think I smelt him. Both times it was a heavy, musty, almost mouldy odour, like old sweat or wet dog. The second time I was with a girlfriend. This was in my teen years and I record something else that Charlie has said. Never go into Sasquatch territory with a woman who was on her period, because he could smell that and would track her, according to legend, to find a mate. It was the first time I ever asked a girl if she was on her period. She was. Needless to say, quite embarrassed to answer that it was that time of the month. That was when I told her we needed to leave now, and we started out of the woods. We both swore we heard sticks breaking and branches rustling behind us the entire way out. And we both had that terrifying pit in your stomach you get when you know that something is watching you. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as part of our long trip out west. I had picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff and in a really isolated location. I'm talking about 20 miles of gravel roads in the middle of a national forest. So we get there and set up our tents and hike a little bit and take pictures of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents, 
and decide to stop and talk to the other campers nearby, because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona, and they told us not to worry, and that the storm didn't get that terrible around this area. That was all the persuasion that we needed to stay. Later on, while walking a bit further down the campsite, we see a woman with her dog and another older lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit further into the forest. Let me elaborate that because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our site and make sure our car was only a few yards away and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight due to the storm clouds and it hasn't begun to rain yet. So we decide to try and sleep right away so that we could possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It is an insanely windy night, so it is hard to sleep. But eventually we get a bit of shut eye. I wake up at 10.30 PM to the sound of some crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because they get a lot of flash floods out here and I didn't want to fall off the side of the cliff. But I tell myself to try and sleep and eventually I doze off again. It's 12 AM and I wake up once more. This time, because I hear something heavy hitting the side of our tent. Like full on sound, like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I opened my eyes and couldn't see anything. It was completely dark, no light whatsoever. This sound continued every couple of minutes. And it was at this point that I was soiling myself. Suddenly, I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent. They are slow, but steady. I feel my entire body freeze up. I seriously start thinking about how this is it. And I'm about to die. My heart is beating so fast that I am certain whatever is out there can hear it. Then whatever it is, lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it's a bear and realizing that I might actually have to face this thing in a desperate call for my husband's mind reading powers. I squeeze his hand really repetitively and he wakes up. But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out. What's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right as he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again. So after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I'd heard. We decide it may have been an animal passing by. But whatever is hitting our tent continues every so often. And I'm starting to go a little insane from this night, wondering what's going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pines falling from trees above us and try to sleep again. We just need to make it through one night. And then we can laugh about it in the morning. A couple of minutes go by and suddenly the tent caves in on my husband's side right on his head. He whispers that it feels like something is pushing the tent and I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out thinking it's a bear that just sat on his head, but he decides to push back and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off our tent that we've been hearing for the past few hours. And then we realize that it's been snowing outside and the noise we were hearing was heavy ice falling from the trees onto our tent. Our tent is covered in thick ice and my husband pushes the tent from the inside until all of the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear. We try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on a small light that my husband had luckily brought with him just to calm us down a little. Things are starting to seem normal again. We both close our eyes. It's 3am at this point, not even 30 minutes after we had settled down 
my literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, we hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, what the hell, oh my God, followed by some other non-tangible words that sound a lot like help. The way that she screamed didn't sound like anger. It sounded like terror and a sense of pure panic. My husband and I are both frozen looking for each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do because what the hell, how is this really happening now? While we are trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again. But this time she is screaming, no, 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 as we hear a car speed off into the night. I'm in tears at this point. We have no idea what's happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she wasn't in the car, but more like she was desperately yelling or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was the breaking point. Because I could take the bad weather. I could take the possible bear outside my tent. I could even take ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states of America. But this thing, I cannot and will not be ever able to handle. A screaming person in the middle of the pitch black woods at 3 a.m.? We decide to get out of there and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to the car. But instead, we try to stay level headed, grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather our things and stay close as we shuffle into the car. I close the doors and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract unwelcome visitors. And while my husband goes back to grab the tent, I dial for 911. I tell them what I'd heard, where we were, and they say that they're sending someone to the campsite to make sure everything's all right. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention the storm let those gravel roads in some pretty terrible conditions. So my husband and I decide to start driving, and it's about 3.30 a.m. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had left. All three of their cars had gone, while their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they sure left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me. Whatever was walking next to my tent may not have been an animal. It could very well have been someone lurking around in the dark, who decided to go after the girl we had seen previously on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night, and I hope that everyone got out there okay. I called the police department back to follow up, and was told that the cops searched the area for a few hours, talked with a few people who were still there, but didn't find anything. I am a 24-year-old female that moved from Orlando, Florida to 18 miles outside of Valdosta, Georgia. Basically, the middle of nowhere. It was to my family's farm. I never had any issues in Orlando, but I got divorced and had to move in with my mother. It was my two small boys and I. Anyway, we moved into one of the old farmhouses on my family's farm, and it needed a lot of work. It was eight bedrooms and a mother-in-law suite. When we moved in, we only had two rooms cleaned up and worked on the rest of the house over the course of the nine months. The man across the street, Jay, was very helpful. From day one, he would come over almost every day as he was feeding up his animals and help with anything I needed. Over the course of nine months, I never had any issues and thought he was just a friendly middle-aged man. I never felt he had any ill intentions. The farmhouse was in a U-shape. The room I chose had windows in the courtyard area. 
This was the middle of the house. Jay had fenced in that area when I first moved in, so that I could let the boys play. The farmhouse was in the middle of the farm, and set off the road so I never had any worries of being watched, mostly as my bedroom windows are in the fenced in area, in the middle of the house. So I didn't put curtains on my bedroom or bathroom. One day, my son was playing under the carport, and Jay pulled up in his truck. He was going to look at my car for me. Jay didn't make it to the carport before my eldest son says to me, Hey, I saw him in my window last night. Later that night, I talked to my son, and he told me he did see him out a window. I asked him if it was the kitchen window, because you can see his horse pastures, and he stops to feed them every morning and night. Chalking it up to that, I didn't think much else about it. But other things had happened. I guess you could say, I wanted him to be the person I thought he was, so I overlooked a lot. My favourite candy somehow appeared in my fridge one day after school. My mum told me she remembered me telling Jay it was my favourite, and someone sent me flowers every Friday for a couple of months. I thought it was my ex-husband, or possibly my boyfriend at the time, but neither man would admit to it. My boyfriend jokingly told me it was Jay. The next day I came home from school, and my mum had the boys playing under the carport, and Jay was working on my car. My air suspension had a leak, and Jay offered to look at it before I took it all the way to Tallahassee for the expensive repair. I got out of my mother's car, and he asked me if he wanted to see the leak I had found. As I bent over the hood, Jay stepped back. When I turned around, I commented jokingly on his 90s era cell phone he had in his hand. It's the type you don't see anymore like a very early camera flip phone. Later that night, we came inside, and my mum told me she could swear that Jay had taken a picture of me on his phone. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't believe her. This man was seriously always friendly. Never any weird vibes from him. If I offered to pay him, it was always at cost, and that was rare as he would not accept my money. I should have known that people just aren't like that these days. I guess I was very naive. A couple of weeks later, I was mowing my courtyard. It was growing up pretty bad, and as I got close to my window, my heart literally sank to my butt. I had a newly placed center block outside both windows and my bathroom window. I can't tell you how, but I knew at that point I had made a huge mistake, and everyone was right about Jay. I called my friend and neighbour Josh to come look at the centre blocks. He ran home and got a deer cam, attaching it to a tree outside my window. This was at 3pm in the afternoon. That night I came home around 6, and was unloading the boys when I turned around and Jay was standing right behind me. He said that he didn't mean to scare me, and he heard from my mother that I was out of town. I said, yes, sir. I knew he knew, because they are friends on Facebook. He told me to call him if I got scared or needed anything. I got the boys inside, and we got snuggled into bed. They fell asleep in my bed when I realised that I had missed Sunday's Game of Thrones episode. It was a really good one. So I went to my mother's bed to watch. I was laying there talking to my ex-husband about the boys and the show when Josh called. I clicked over and he asked me if my boyfriend was over. I told him no, that it was 9.02pm. And he told me that a man is outside my window. The deer cam snapped the first picture at 9.02. My boys are in my room sleeping. Josh told me not to worry. He was already coming up the driveway, and to meet him outside the other side of the house. 
fear and dread literally drained through me. I slowly walked into the other room and calmly scooped up my boys. I shut the door and sprinted through the house as fast as I could. We sat in Josh's truck until the police arrived. The deer cam snapped photos at 9.02, 9.22 and 9.30. He stood outside my window that long waiting for me to come back. The police walked back into the field and could see where he was parking, but he had already gone. Behind the house is a massive produce field and it was a tractor road for tractor access. I showed them the photos and ID'd Jay. He was arrested at 2am that morning, and when they went through his phone, there were nine months worth of pictures. Pictures of me mowing, pictures of me playing with my kids, pictures of me in my bathroom, sleeping, bending over the hood of my car. He was watching me the entire time. I couldn't and didn't sleep for weeks. He ended up getting out of jail the following weekend and came into my mum's post office, she is a male lady, to tell her that he found my dog dead and he buried it for me. And even after that, I only received five years probation and a restraining order. He still lives across the street. I stayed for maybe three months and then moved on to Fort Wharton Beach. This is a story passed down to me from my late father. He was an avid storyteller and often told this story when he was drunk, but never when he was sober. This happened to him when he was a young lad, maybe 40 years ago now. He and his girlfriend at the time had gotten into a huge fight and broken up. His friend Jack told him the only way to console him would be to have a night around the campfire in the woods. On their way there, Jack drove my father into the woods and parked at a spot where no one else was stationed. They took their gear in through the darkness and found a spot about 20 minutes away from where they'd left the car. It was quiet and a peaceful night with the moon shining brightly over their heads illuminating the canopy of trees above them and the foliage beneath them. Their spot was quite bare, perfect to start a campfire and to set up their tent. They whipped out the beers and started drinking and having general merry conversation. My father confided in Jack all the things that happened to deteriorate the relationship and as a 20 year old man, he was quite upset. Jack did his best to reassure him, and as the beers kept flowing in, the night seemed to get better, and the thoughts of this girl breaking my father's heart were slowly being washed away by the alcohol. I believe my father said he was around on his fifth beer, although truth be told, he usually does lose count. He said that something was off. That whole evening, they'd been happy by the roaring fire, eating their snacks, drinking their alcohol, with the pleasant little buzz of the forest in the background, the chirps, the noises, the general background hum made from everything in the forest. It was almost like the sound had been turned off. One moment it was there, and the next, it was just their voices and the crackling of the fire. It got very creepy, and it seemed as though the world was slightly darker again. They looked around and didn't see anything. There was no cause for concern, not anything immediately apparent anyway. So they sat there, just seeing their surroundings. Like I said, the moonlight gave plenty of illumination, so they could very clearly see what was around them, but saw nothing. Why did all the sounds stop, they wondered. 
they sat there in silence for a little bit, debating whether or not it were important for them to do something, like leave, or if they should just stay, and that the animals are just being weird. Their thought process didn't take all that long. Not long after the sounds had disappeared, did a foul stench appear from nowhere. This was before the movie Shrek came out. No. My father compared it to leaving food to rot out in the sun and then having to take a good old whiff of it from up close. He said the odour was so pungent that it infested their noses and that they wanted to leave straight away. With all the weirdness that was going on, they were starting to get uncomfortable. So my father thanked his friend for making him feel better, and they both agreed to go back to his house to finish off the last few beers and just to have a general chilled night. They started packing everything up when they heard something in the distance. They weren't entirely sure what it was, like a crackling, like twigs snapping. They thought it could be another person. Could another person smell that bad? So they yelled out and asked them to come forward, that they had beer that they'd like to share and to generally just have a chill night. No one stepped forward. The sound stopped and they waited patiently awaiting a reply. They didn't get one. So they quickly packed up their stuff and started hauling it back to the car. They didn't hear anything on their run back, but just as they were driving away, the headlights illuminated something, what appeared to be eyes in the forest. The eyes, however, were far too high to be a person. They could see the outline of some kind of creature, humanoid, standing anywhere between six to eight feet high, immobile. They drove away and tried not to think about it. The reason this incident stuck out in my father's head, it was because he was traumatized from breaking up with his first love. And then this happens on the same night. Talk about bad luck, double whammy. He never went into more detail than that. But I always wonder, did my dad have an encounter with the elusive Bigfoot? I am from Finland, and that's also where the things I'm about to describe to you happened. This was some years ago, pre-smartphone slash GPS era. It was at the end of summer, and myself and two friends were on a camping trip up in the north in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10 day trek. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center. And this happened within the premises of the Urko Gekkonon National Park, a 985 square mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly from treeless and semi mountainous to dense forest of spruce and pine and dwarf birch. There are lots of swamps. Seeing reindeer is not uncommon, and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can run into a bear or wolverine in this place, but of course normally they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent, but some nights we used shelters and simple huts provided for travellers free of charge. The trip had lasted five days, and we were at the furthest of any kind of civilization we were going to be on during that particular outing. Truly in the middle of nowhere, there really is nothing there. There are no villages, towns or industries. The place is a national park after all. Seeing other hikers happened from time to time. You'd see some people in the distance, maybe. Very rarely you may even come face to face with them. So in the middle of our trip, we were camping in a small clearing. Woodland extended 
around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark. We had eaten our evening meal, and all three of us were jammed into our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humour in the dark, like guys in their twenties do. Right before we were about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it talking, and the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent, because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us. We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was a human voice, no doubt about it. But nothing could really explain the sound of machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank, something big, powerful, and really not too far away. Combined with the sound of talking, we thought construction yard? But at the time of night, it's an unpopulated protective nature reserve. We get out of the tent. It was cold and pitch black. The campfire had some coals in it still glowing, and we took out our flashlights. My two buddies have always been a lot braver than I. The sound was coming from the north, maybe a half a kilometre away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We couldn't see any lights or anything. We still could not make out what was being said. The speaking-like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible to even say which language was being used. It still sounded a lot like a person speaking, though. You may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing a human voice in static. Maybe you've used a blow dryer and been sure someone is talking. Turn it off, and it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum. Maybe it was sort of like that. It's hard to explain. The machinery-like sound continued. Not loud but you could sort of make out the powerful engine, at times accelerating and adding power, and at times idle. My two friends resolved to go and find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, adding some more wood to it. I would stay at camp while my buddies left to check out this mysterious construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So there I sat. The guys took their maps out, took a compass heading, and left, and I could hear them make their way through the forest. See the light from the flashlights, and they were gone. The weird sounds continued, unaltered. They were gone 15 minutes, then maybe 30, then the better part of an hour. It was odd. Judging by the volume of the sound, they should have reached it, checked it out, and been back already. I added more firewood, and tried to make out what the person talking was saying, but it was too tiny and obscure. The guys had been away for two hours at this point. I figured that they had stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. Then the sound stopped. Just like that, it just ended all at the same time. The engine sound and the voice both just quit. It was very silent. I waited for another 30 minutes, very worried now that something had happened, and maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try and find them? I shouted their names several times and built the fire pretty big. I was scared witless when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends. Apparently they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to the camp out of breath. They told me the following. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source. They had to stop every now and then, be quiet, and listen to see if they were able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not going to get any closer. The sounds did not change in volume at all. 
they decided to just go on a bit further several times, when suddenly the sound just stopped, like someone had pressed a button on a recording. They realised they had been gone for a long time. They were in the middle of the dark woods, alone. They reversed the heading, and started back at a brisk pace. Eventually they saw my massive fire from the top of the hill, and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seem to think the sound stopped at different times. They'd been gone two and a half hours in total. They said the sound stopped at around the one hour fifteen mark, after they left. They then started to head back immediately, return trip taking a bit longer, even though they kept a good pace. They apparently wandered around for a bit. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark, just thirty minutes before they returned. We did not sleep that night. Nothing more happened on the trip, and we never found out what the weird construction yard-like sounds were about. When we returned to the park visitor centre some five days later, we asked around, but no one knew of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole national park area. It has been bugging me ever since. I am a fly fisherman, who spends every weekend out hiking remote rivers and streams in search of brown trout. I live in Montreal. My usual routine is to drive down to a river that starts in upstate New York, fish a couple of kilometres of the river, where no one really lives or goes, then head across the border to head back down to the river on the Canadian side. So I'm out there one morning by myself. I had been out there over a hundred times, so it wasn't new territory by any means. That said, I was getting close to the area where other anglers had warned me about angry landowners and threats from dudes with shotguns, so I was pretty alert. I come down to the section of river, and there's kind of a split, around a little island of fifty to a hundred feet. But it reconnects, and the Hu River veers off to the left. Most days I stay left of the island. There are a few holes, and this day I went right. So my view up the river was obscured until I came around a corner of the island. I get to the point, look up about 250 feet in front of me, and standing there is this beige golden animal crossing the river. My first thought was it's someone's dog. Hmm, no, too remote of an area. I'm standing there looking at this thing crossing the river, and things are racing through my head, because what I'm looking at doesn't make sense to me from where I'm standing. This thing still hasn't seen me. It's just gingerly making its way through about one or two feet of water, trying to cross across at a determined walk. That's when I notice the tail. I know a lot of dogs, but I've never seen a tail like... And then the hair on the back of my neck goes up. I'm looking at a mountain lion. In upstate New York, about a kilometre from the Canadian border. I step back behind a tree. I stood there for a few more seconds waiting for it to cross. When it got to the other side, there was no doubt in what I'd seen. I decided that I'd gone far enough for the day, and began making my way back to the truck, which, with the way the river bends, is pretty much in the same direction the cat was going. Oh dear. I get back to the truck, make my way home, and contact the New York Fish and Game. I provide some data, and they say they'll look into it. Most buddies who I fish with out there think I'm nuts, obviously. And then, my parents send me a clip from a local newspaper about a month later, confirming that it's been spotted. A couple of years later, I come across another article. So needless to say, I feel a little less crazy. My fellow anglers and I exercised a little more caution in that area henceforth. You know, when I saw this cat, he didn't see me. The wind was in the right direction, 
so I doubt he smelled me. But I didn't even get a glance from him. So, while obviously rattled, I didn't fear for my life at that moment. A year or so later, the same river but about six to seven kilometers away, I was out fishing one evening. It was roughly seven to 7.30 on a June evening. I was alone and I could without a doubt hear something sneaking through the woods making its way towards me. I'd hear a branch crack and silence. Maybe a few steps. It was weird. It started off way off, and it just got closer and closer to me. I called out. If someone's out there, there's no need to sneak around. It was dead quiet. I fished a few more minutes, and this thing was just creeping closer and closer. It got about 30 feet from me, but I couldn't see into the bush. It was too dark. There was too much bush. I could feel the eyes. I backed out of the river, and the eyes never left the spot until I reached the far bank. And I walked about half a kilometer down the stream on the opposite side of the bank from the sounds to a different spot. I get down there, and within 30 minutes, whatever it was has followed me and was creeping up on me again. I was thinking that this wasn't funny anymore. I scream out into the silence, Hey dude, this isn't funny anymore. And I met with silence. Okay, enough of this. I backed out of the river and back up to my vehicle and got the hell out of there. I really felt like I was being stalked. And let me tell you, it was not a fun experience. The spot where I fish, Two to three kilometers on both sides of the border, I've just seen some weird stuff. Everything from weird shady campsites that are way too close to the border that pop up overnight, to being stalked at dusk, escaped convicts, mountain lions, hunters, and angry landowners. Sometimes if you go down there and the wind is right, you can literally hear voices come from all around you. Now I know that that sounds insane. But I've been down there with half a dozen people, and we've all heard it. The stuff I go through just to hook a few nice brown trout. Very early on a cool, dark, moonless morning in November, I eat breakfast quickly with the friends I'm camping with, and hop into my car to head to my hunting spot. We're bow hunting in southern Ohio. An annual tradition, camped on a high bluff in sight of the Ohio River. On chilled fall nights, with a blanket of stars above us, and a fire pushing a cloud of smoke to the sky, we can see the lights from barges moving slowly up and down the river. At this place, for four days, we are in a different world. Hundreds of miles from the bustling and familiar cities we've come from. Not that these thousands of acres of woods aren't becoming more familiar over the years, but what brings us back is the unknown. I drive out of the camp alone, down a paved road for several miles, then turn north, away from the river, up a dirt road meandering through one of the thousands of hollows rippled across this landscape. I'm exiting cellular service, rolling along a winding road following a creek bottom, a deep valley with a large hill ascending on both sides. But I can see nothing but the grey glow of the gravel, and the trees and shadows dancing in my headlights. I pull off the road as far as I dare, and park an empty gear from the car all is quiet as possible. Everything from this point is prepared and navigated with the light of my headlamp, set to the dimmest setting. I close the car door with a gentle nudge, avoiding any sound that would intrude too deeply into the forest. Before the hike, I pause, breathe in the cool fall air and assess my surroundings totally black, and with very little wind. Dead quiet. I'll have to be exceptionally silent on my way to avoid detection. I stalk down a hill, 
and cross the shallow creek, each step slow and deliberate, feet searching first for any stick that might snap under my weight. Carefully, I wind through a narrow trail that I've partially trimmed through the impassable thicket of briars and brush that runs along the creek. At the base of a tree, I prepare a stand, used to ascend the tree for the hunt. Inching my way up the tree, I see nothing but the blackness, watching only the texture of the bark pass directly in front of my face. Once in position, at about 20 feet, all activity stops, and I disappear back into the silence of the woods. Every few minutes a sip of coffee, just as the sky begins to provide enough light for me to see my surroundings, shooting light it's called, well, before the morning sun will appear, I hear a crackling and rustling ahead from down the hill, at maybe a hundred and fifty yards. Is it a deer? If so, it's running. But why? During the November rut, white-tailed bucks are known to chase does for long distances through the woods, desperate for a breeding opportunity. I've seen this dozens of times. Something about this is different, though. And the closer it comes, the less familiar it seems. Only several seconds pass, and the animal is in sight. Or maybe it's more appropriate to say that the exact location of the sound is now apparent, because I can't determine what I am seeing, or if I am seeing anything at all. I can hunt for weeks without the satisfaction of a deer passing by my stand, but oddly enough, this thing is heading right to my location, at a speed that's making me uncomfortable. The creek bottom begins its topography up the hill, with a very steep, if not vertical, wall of rocks. There is very little vegetation here, a few leaves collected in the fissures. I finally perceive the creature crest this drop off, and this is at my eye level. I'm 20 feet up a tree. But before I can make it, it's already descended the feature at full speed, and it's heading right to me. Now it's just light enough that I can describe any leaf on the forest floor, but I can only describe the source of the noise as a bodiless, translucent whirl of brown and grey and black, as though I can see right through it, moving in a perfectly straight line, too straight, along the forest floor at extremely high speed. The coffee and the hike have ensured that I have my wits about me, and I'm suddenly struck with the thought that whatever this thing is, it may climb this tree. Anything that can slice through the forest as though trees and rocks and everything else doesn't exist can surely climb a tree, or perhaps jump the full distance. My chest is slammed with adrenaline in the split second that I watch it cruising from the bottom of the hill towards me. My pulse booms in my ears. The intensity of terror peaks as it arrives. There has been no time. I am not prepared. They say a mountain lion will watch you. You'll never know it's there. And if it decides to kill you, it will be in a split second. We delude ourselves to believe that the unexpected may be manageable to some degree. That we could make the decision to prevent disaster. This is often false. There are forces in creation that are not only overpowering and unpredictable, they are nearly instantaneous. Staring helplessly, I watch this devil pass under, almost touching the tree. Thank God for this tree. Never does it reveal itself. Always a blur, a violent storm of leaves, a ghost, never an animal. Only a presence. It rushes past and pierces through the thickest brush imaginable, down through the creek, never slowing, never acknowledging the seven-inch bank of the creek, never changing course, at absolutely supernatural speed. Same as it came, but in the opposite direction. I listen to the sticks 
and vegetation mark its terrible progress until the sound became distant, and then it was no more. Terrain that would take a man 15 minutes to traverse, if at all, was covered in seconds. A heavy chill runs through my body, and although this sense of dread abates a little, I'm overcome with a heavy eeriness. A feeling of having encountered something unexplainable. Supernatural. No, of course not. It was a coyote or a bobcat or a fox. Yes, that's probably what it was. My mind is desperate to make sense of it. I turn to the rock wall along the hill. Can the animal I know descend a wall like that? Maybe. But would they? And if they did, wouldn't I be able to see them? Yes. Does any animal run that fast? I don't think so. This is unusual. I sit in the tree motionless, sedate and tingling, trying to reconcile. I look up the creek to a thick, brushy meadow along the shaded bottoms to the north. A fog hovers over all in silence. The woods filled with a hypnotic and isolated beauty. I gaze for some time, and slowly the sun crests the hill to the east, causing a few beams to the top of the fog, and the golden leaves remain on the trees. Gradually the shadows retreat, and daylight moves into the forest. I saw no other creatures that day. I'm going to try and give as many details as possible. I live in Ohio around Youngstown, and my family owns a cabin in Pennsylvania, near the Allegheny Forest. It's my grandpa's cabin, and he's a retired firefighter. Years ago, he and his firefighter friends would go hunting in the forest. His friends stayed in a tree stand, while the rest were spread out amongst the property in various stands. Around lunchtime, they planned to meet up and eat. Calling the friend, he wouldn't answer for anyone over any sort of walkie-talkie or anything. They decided to meet up and go check on him. They found him petrified, hiding duck down in the stand. They said small trees looked like they'd been snapped with ease. He was as white as a ghost. He claimed there was a large, estimated eight foot tall humanoid creature that stunk so bad he had been tearing down trees left right and center and walked under the stand so tall his head almost touched it he had no idea what it was and in all his years of hunting he had never seen anything like it he didn't know what to think of it my grandpa is very skeptical and wouldn't make up this story for no reason whatsoever. It just makes you think. In 2007, I was a freshman going on sophomore in college, and my brother Martin was still in high school. We have two much younger siblings, so at the time, they were around elementary school age. My parents decided to take a cruise for their 20th wedding anniversary that year. So my brother and I were voluntold to watch my younger brother and sister, Cole and Charlotte. My brother's best friend, Christian, stayed with us while my parents were gone, and he helped us plan fun activities for the younger siblings. One idea they were particularly excited about was a camping trip as my family had never been particularly outdoorsy in the past. Their eyes lit up at the prospect of cooking our dinner on an open campfire and fishing in the stream. Since it was early summertime, we had the great luck of warm but not too hot weather and beautiful clear skies for stargazing. Finally, we packed and readied for the somewhat long drive to the mountains. We checked into our campsite before dark and Cole and Charlotte helped us to set up the tent. 
It was strange, but there were no other people at the campground, which was unusual for this time of year. Once we finished dinner, the young brother and sister were ready for sleep. So Martin, Christian and I stayed awake a little longer catching up and getting things ready for the next morning. Suddenly, a white Astro van pulled up into the camping spot directly next to ours. He had dozens to choose from, but he chose to park right next to us. Oh well, Christian said, at least we have company now. He called out a quick hello to the new neighbour, but received no reply. I got an uneasy feeling almost immediately, but decided to push it aside and continue to get the fishing poles ready for the morning, and put the food away for the night to ward off bears and wild animals. Over the next hours or so, things started to get weird. The man parked next to us got out of his van to sit at the picnic table with only a small fire. From our roaring fire, I could see that he was looking directly at us. However, his fire died out completely several minutes later, and he just continued to sit there. I could feel him staring, but I couldn't see his face anymore. He was just sitting there, breathing. Christian and Martin noticed that I was uneasy, and they picked up on how creepy the situation had started to become. Martin whispered, Why is he breathing like that? I don't feel safe anymore. I told Christian and Martin that I was going to stay awake, because I didn't trust that guy. As soon as they moved from the fire into their tents, the man rose from the picnic table and started moving towards us. I called out hello, and received no response from him. Finally, in a whim of panic, I demanded that we pack up and get home immediately. Christian and Martin got out of the tents, and saw the figure of the man just standing there staring at us, breathing hard. We tried to stay quiet and calm as possible, while we packed up most of our things and not to alarm Cole and Charlotte, finally throwing everything in the trunk. We drove away, and didn't look back. Before leaving the site itself, I asked if we could go to the check-in area at the lodge to see what the hell was going on, and see if they knew anything more. What was the guy's deal? But to my surprise, there was no one else registered at the camping site that evening. The story doesn't end there, though. About six months later, I was in my sophomore year of school, when a local hiker went missing in a county over from where we camped and where I went to college. She was doing something so normal, hiking with her dog. Sadly, she turned up several months later, murdered, and found in a white Astro van. When the news finally released photos of the van and the man's face, I knew it was him. I got a phone call from my brother and his friend, and they recognised him too. We came to find out that it wasn't his first murder several years later, and he became known as the National Forest Serial Killer. I sincerely mean it when I say that I am incredibly cautious when I'm camping now because of this encounter. Thinking that it could have been us or my younger siblings still gives me nightmares to this day. We recently had a reunion, Christian, Martin and I, and we talked about what happened to us with more than 10 years gone. It's amazing we all still remember the details, as they are etched into our memories forever. There is an ice road in northern Alberta, that's only open for three to four months of the year when the rivers freeze over. Anyway. I took to the road rather than flying up a remote community, where I was working for a project. It was bizarre. First of all, there's no lights except for your vehicles. It's crazy for your GPS to be like, I have no idea, man. I think you're in a river. Anyway, I pulled over to take a leak. It was in the evening, so you couldn't see much. Midstream, I had a weird danger shudder 
and jumped back into my truck. About 15 seconds later, I saw a couple of lynx, or minks, coming down and strolling as they were sniffing around my truck. They aren't huge, but I have no doubt they could have taken me down. So I ended up peeing in an empty bottle. This happened during the summer of 2012, when I was 15 and still an active member of a local Boy Scouts troop. I went camping, something my troop had frequently done. The camp we chose was for a full weekend. It was a nice forested area with taller grass. It also lacked other campers and we saw no cars driving in or out throughout the time we spent there. Since we did not have to worry about other campers, our troop had a big campfire on Saturday night that went late into the night. Eventually, our campfire started to die out, prompting us to put it out and respectively hit the hay. Oddly for me, I was unable to sleep that night. I usually slept well on campouts, especially when I have the pleasure of using a tent alone, like I had done on this occasion. So I sat there in complete silence, listening to the various sounds around my tent. Eventually I found myself dozing off, until I heard something walk nearby our campsite. There was a very apparent rustling of grass that began to get closer and closer to the blob tents that our boys were sleeping in. After a solid minute of movement, the sound stopped right in front of a tent that was about seven or so feet from mine. I then heard the rustling start up again and head off in the direction of the forest. I was paralyzed with fear. What could have made the sound? I thought about it for a few solid minutes and eventually decided it must have been an adult checking on us. Before I went to sleep, I looked out the tent little mesh window at my side and did not see anything out of the ordinary in our campsite. This sound went on a bit into the distance, but I did not record for how long as I eventually fell asleep. I woke up later that night to the same sound of rustling, Yet this time, it was closer to our tent circle, as it was the first time I heard it. While I did not think about this too much, I silently listened to the sound to see where it was heading, and once again, went to the same area it did the first time. Being curious, I peered through the tent window to see what was making the noise. My face turned white, and I couldn't move. My mind was still trying to register what was going on. I saw a large, black figure standing before the tent in the darkness, and it was clear it was not a scout, as the figure had no flashlight on it, and it was far too large to be any boy in our troop. Suddenly, the figure inched their hand to the tent door and began to slowly unzip it. After what felt like several minutes, the figure seemed to poke their head into the tent. Immediately after, a deafening scream came from that tent. I heard other tents being unzipped, and saw lights being flashed at the one tent, as well as the black figure starting to run away from the tent. Within seconds, the figure was running out of view from the tree line. A few adults in the adult camp came to see the commotion, the boys who were in the tent told what they had experienced, and several boys mentioned that they heard the sound of rustling in the grass around our tents throughout the night. Unfortunately, none of the boys were able to get a clear view of the person, except that the figure looked like a man wearing dark clothing. Disturbed, the adults had us moved to the campsite where they were staying at and two adults volunteered to stay awake for the rest of the night, in case the creep returned. The next morning, we quickly packed up our stuff and left as soon as possible. We warned the ranger in charge who called the local sheriff. From what I know, 
the person was never caught, and our troop never camped there again. It was easily one of the most frightening experiences, and something I would always remember when I went camping during my time as a Boy Scout. This happened a few years ago at my parents' house, in a small town in Wayne County. Anyone that knows the area knows some parts are very rural. Well, my parents live right in town, not far from the centre of it, but in a weird spot. The town has only maybe 500 people in the town limits, and it's surrounded by farmland and forests. They live right near the railroad tracks and canal, and the backyard is pitch black at night, because the street lights don't reach back there. The yard backs up to a walking trail and woods. It's actually pretty creepy back there after dark, even though it's a two blocks from downtown. The night this story takes place, it was extremely dark. I think it was a new moon, or a moonless night and it was overcast to boot. Late summer or early fall, so it was pretty dry, no mud to capture any footprints. My parents, brother and I, were talking in the living room, at the front of the house, the part of the house facing town and light. The house is kind of long and skinny, maybe 30 by 40 feet wide, but probably 120 to 150 feet long. As we're talking, the family dog stood up and looked around and started to growl really low. He was a yellow lab of about 90 pounds, half deaf and blind from diabetes. Overall, he was a really chill dog. He'd never barked at other dogs and very rarely barked at people. That's what made this so odd. His cackles went up and he started barking towards the back of the house. There were at least two closed doors before you even got to the room where the back door is. The dog is now like full on berserk, barking at the closed door in the hallway. We opened it and followed him to see why he was going nuts. We get to the door to the back room and are now worried someone has broken in. But when we opened it, Marley shot straight to the back door, jumping and barking and snarling, making sounds I've never heard this big baby of a dog make. I opened the back door and he tried to bolt out. He was going to attack whoever or whatever was there. Me and my parents step out on the back porch and close Marley inside. He still sounds almost rabid. We wait for a second for our eyes to adjust, because the backyard is pitch black. We see a silhouette, maybe 40 or 50 feet away, standing at the edge of the yard, right near the railroad tracks access road. Now, to say this was big is an understatement. It was way over six feet tall, probably closer to seven and a half or eight, and extremely broad. I'd think... It was a potential burglar that we caught sneaking up to the house, if it wasn't so colossal. My parents to this day swear it was a black bear. Officially, according to the DEC, black bears don't live anywhere near this area and haven't for a long time. Also, the size of it would have been a record-sized bear. The reaction of my dog going nuts doesn't seem like what a bear would do. After we had put Marley inside, it just stood there, upright, for about two minutes, before we decided it was best to go inside, as the hairs on the back of our necks were standing up. The reason it freaked me out was even at the distance it was at, you could hear it breathe, deep, raspy breaths. It sounded like it was breathing right next to my ear. They were slow and steady, not like someone who was out of breath. It wasn't like they were trying to make their breath sound loud. It just was. 
I immediately went to find a flashlight. But when I got back outside, whatever it was was gone. No tracks, no fur, just a huge silhouette that was too big to be a person, but acted unlike any wild animal that I have ever seen. I used to do a lot of camping and hunting with my dad. We lived in Michigan and going up north was a common activity for us. I think the main difference between us and other people who did the same thing was that my dad liked to go way off the beaten path, like really deep into the woods. Oftentimes, he would end up parking his truck somewhere once we couldn't go any further in and would hike for several miles carrying all our gear. The last time we went camping was definitely the weirdest one. My dad was excited because he got a full wheel drive, brand new, and he wanted to see how far he could push it. After a lot of driving, some of it being scary and made me think I was going to die, we ended up in a small clearing. It was nearly dark at the time, so we quickly made up a tent, had some food and went to bed. When we woke up in the morning, we got a better idea of the clearing. It seemed to have been a common campsite, or that was the evidence. There was an area someone had a fire, firewood, and the grass was compressed in other areas, like someone had walked there for a while. I think there may have also been some trash. Further exploring around the area, I find what I called a swamp. It was a bed of water where trees and branches had fallen into or were growing out of. It had an eerie quality, but I was more afraid of snakes. After checking that out with my dad, we decided we were going to walk further into the forest, where the trees were thick and a truck couldn't get through. We were walking for maybe an hour when we came into another clearing. Before we even got there, we could hear something. As we approached, we found the source. We went immediately from a very dense forest into a very open area with low grass. Directly in front of us was a wooden cabin. In front of it were rusted out cars that seemed to be impossibly placed due to how dense the trees were. To the left of us was a cliff that just seemed to shoot straight down. Coming from the cabin was a lot of noise, and as we approached further, we could tell it was a woman screaming. What she was screaming I wasn't sure. I couldn't make it out, but she was obviously mad about something. I remember wanting to check out the cliff more, but my dad stopped me suddenly and stared like he was trying to figure something out and told me to turn back immediately. We were practically running back to the campsite and when we got there, he immediately had us pack up everything and get back in the truck to leave. I'm not sure what he saw or heard, but it was sure enough to scare him, which I had never seen before. We were both armed as well, and my dad had earned various medals in the army for rifle use and sharp shooting. He was an amazing shot, and when he had his hunting rifle, his bravery seemed to be endless. I think that's what's creeped me out the most. Whatever it was, he knew he couldn't protect me or himself from it. I went on a backpacking trip with a friend when I was younger. We did a one week trip backpacking a portion of the Appalachian Trail. At night, we would start a small campfire for cooking and heat. I can't even begin to explain how dark it was. There was no moonlight. It was literally pitch black. We were quietly sitting by the fire after dinner, crickets chirping and insect noises 
typical sounds you'd expect to hear in the woods. The noise was loud, but not brutally loud, but loud enough that you'd notice it. We basically sat there and listened to the crackle of our fire and nature. All of a sudden, the symphony stopped on a dime. The only noise left was the crackle of our fire. Dead silence. It quickly went from relaxing to terrifying. Usually when an insect stops making noise, it's because there's a predator nearby. When every insect stops making noise, that usually indicates a pretty big predator. Mix that with how dark it was. The light from our fire basically got swallowed by the darkness. Now how could this get worse? We start hearing footsteps in the woods around us and our camping area. Not running, but creeping. Whatever it was would walk a bit, then stop. Then walk a bit more, then stop. We couldn't see a thing. The words, we are being stalked, came out of my mouth. So now my friend and I are terrified. We are as close to the fire as you can get, without actually being in the fire. We both had sidearms, and it still didn't make me feel any better or safer. So the footsteps were getting closer. Not faster, just louder. So whatever was creeping around in the woods was now heading in our general direction. At this point I'm like, well, this is how it ends. So now you have two guys huddled around a campfire, waiting for something to come through a wall of darkness into the firelight and mold the crap out of us. Then we finally met our fate. A very feminine voice sang, Hello, I'm friendly. We're coming towards you. And two wildlife biologists walked out of the darkness. They were studying bats. Obviously the best time to study bats would be at night. It was a man and a woman, and they sat with us for a few minutes and told us the entire process. It was really neat to listen to. They also wanted to let us know that they'd be out and about in our area for most of the night, and they didn't want to scare us. Too late. We chit-chatted for a couple more minutes, and then they went back on their way. After they were out of hearing distance, my friend and I looked at each other, and he said, I peed my pants to stay warm, not because I was scared. It's a known survival tactic. Up until I heard them say hello, I was honestly waiting for an angry Sasquatch to come charging out the woods, pick me up, and use me like a baseball bat to beat my friend to death. So my scariest experience in the woods was meeting two wildlife biologists. I've seen a lot of the usual stuff out in northwestern Canada, but the only thing that made me really think twice about going into the woods out there was not wanting to find a body. There are dozens, hundreds of unsolved missing person cases out there, many of them indigenous men and women, and white people as well. There are signs up everywhere with information about missing. I hope they're found and the families find some closure, but I dreaded being the one to come across a corpse. The other thing that made me think twice were the bullet holes everywhere. Blowing holes in highway signs is bad, but these guys would shoot up outhouses. Nothing like taking a dump and counting the bullet holes in front of your face. Canada has some stricter gun laws than the States, but people still make bad decisions. This experience takes place about four years ago at my parents' house. The house has a fairly long driveway that goes down to the mailbox. We live in a wooded area with a forest on both sides of the house and behind as well. On top of that, we live on a dead end road with only a few houses. So it's quiet, dark and isolated at night. It was about 10 at night when I was on my way down to get the mail. 
A few months before this, my mum had told me about strange sounds she heard in the woods behind the house early one morning. She said that she was taking the dog out to go to the bathroom, and she heard what she described as a hooting sound like a monkey in the woods. My mum is one of the most level-headed and down-to-earth people I've ever met. She does not believe in anything paranormal, but she told me that she immediately thought of Bigfoot, and it freaked her out. So fast forward, back to the night of getting to the mail. I get to the end of the driveway, and I hear this sound coming back from the woods down the road, and it's something I've never heard. I have lived here my entire life, and I've heard everything that lives in these woods. But this was something that I have no comparison for, except a howler monkey with a deep voice. It made a kind of ooh and ah sound, like it was hooting, that increased in volume and intensity with every hoot. It reminded me of the primate house at the zoo. I immediately thought of my mother's experience and hauled ass back towards the house. Right before heading inside, I paused again, listening to see if I could hear it, and I heard the same sound in the woods right in front of me about 20 feet in. I can't tell you how much of a chill went down my spine. Whatever it was had followed me through the woods without making a sound. I ran inside to get my brother, who believes in the paranormal, but is skeptical of most stories. I told him to get out here, and that he needed to hear this. You just have to hear it. He rolled his eyes and followed me out. So my brother and I stood in the front of the house, listening to this thing hoot and yell in the woods in front of us. Suddenly, another one answered from across the yard in the woods on the other side of the house, and the trees began shaking in the exact same area. I can't express to you the size of these things just by listening to them. They sounded huge, and the one behind the house was violently shaking the trees. My brother is very stoic and not easily impressed, and he stood there silently with me listening to these two things shouting at each other in the woods, and after several minutes, he quietly said, What is that? I whispered back, I have no idea. My mum later told me that she said it scared the crap out of him. That's the only time I've ever heard this sound, which to me gives it more weight as a strange experience. I've had people try and tell me that I heard two owls. I have lived in the woods my entire life, and I've heard owls many times. This was not an owl. I used to enjoy going for early morning walks as the sun came up. I don't do that anymore. A couple of days ago, my grandma told me a story that happened to her. When she was around eight, she lived in a small house with her sisters and parents. It was in the middle of a large field, and it had trees surrounding it towards the back. There was only a narrow dirt road that connected them to the outside world. One night in May of 1964, she and her sisters had went to sleep for the night. She woke about two hours after she fell asleep and got the horrible feeling that she was being watched. They had a small window six feet up on their wall in the room. She turned and looked at it and saw two glowing eyes. She got really scared, so she woke up one of her sisters her sister began to freak out, and she hid under the blanket. They sat there until the eyes left the window. The next day, they told their mother about the incident, and she didn't believe them. That was until they investigated the outside. There were enormous footprints leading to the window, and then back out into the woods. From that point on, my grandmother and her sister were not allowed to play near the woods. A couple of months later, they heard from a neighbour who lived about seven miles away. He said he lost a couple of cows. He had no idea where they went. There was no blood or body, and the fence was undamaged. 
it was almost like something had just carried them away. After she told me about this story, I think she may have had a Bigfoot encounter. I do a lot of hiking and mountain biking in the woods. Nothing has ever made me not want to go back there, but there has been some weird stuff. First, there's a lot of weird stuff in the woods. Teepees, altars, liantos, shrines. Some of it is pretty creepy, but I think most of it is just built by bored people who are trying to make something creepy so that it makes it a bit less scary. Among the strangest of the things that I've seen are a large clearing of trees with all but one entrance blocked off by webs of red strings stretched across the clearing at least 30 feet in diameter. A wooden tunnel leading to a small room containing defaced religious icons, Buddha statues, crucifixes, stars of David's, and dozens slash hundreds of creepy Polaroid pictures hanging from the ceiling. Ones I remember include a close-up face shot of a girl sleeping, a dude brushing his teeth taken from outside the window, and a photo booth strip of two girls where one of their faces are crossed out, and it says, I'm glad you're dead, written with one word on each picture, and a number of weird little shrines with creepy scriptures printed or scrawled into them. But what's a lot scarier to me is the stuff that isn't meant to be creepy, like the aforementioned things hopefully are. I once heard a distant panicked scream followed by a crashing slash thudding sound. I couldn't tell from which direction it came from, and I didn't hear anything else, so I have no idea what it was. I think the creepiest thing I've experienced was one time while walking home from school through the woods. I heard people talking in the distance, and I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they seemed to be arguing. They were quiet for a minute, and then I heard them again, really close now. The forest was really dense here, so although they sounded maybe 15 to 20 feet away, I couldn't see them or pinpoint exactly where they were. This time, I could hear what they said. Guy number one. It's messed up, man. You always make me- Shh. Someone's coming. Crap. From a bit further away to my left than the other guys, who sounded mostly to the right in front of me, another guy goes, Hurry. Shit. Shh. I came around the corner and expected to see them, but I couldn't see anyone. I kept walking, cautious, and trying to be aware of my surroundings. About ten feet past the corner, I saw something to the left of the trail, close to where the voices were coming from and caught my eye. It was a bunch of stuff wrapped in a big tarp. It wasn't completely wrapped up, and you could kind of see into it. All I could see was something glass, and I wanted to see what it was. I scanned the forest behind the tarp to make sure no one was watching, and then stepped towards it. Suddenly, one of them says, keep walking, very calmly. I looked back into the forest, but still couldn't see anyone. They said, go, still calm. I looked for another second, unable to see a soul, and then turned and kept walking like nothing happened. I don't know what was going on there, but the whole time it gave me the creepiest vibe I've ever gotten. A few years after my father had graduated from CSU, and my mother had graduated from TCU, they both had jobs at a small company in Fort Worth, Texas. Having met at a few company parties, and hitting off things a few years later, they finally got married, and my father got a job in Colorado for a small but growing engineering company. So off they pack, and move from Fort Worth, Texas, to Colorado. Getting in a car with their few belongings, 
they start to make their way there. Now I'm not sure why they took the road they did, but instead of a larger interstate highway, my mother and father decided to take a smaller, not so travelled highway on their final stretch back to my father's hometown to catch Highway 14 to their new home. Having driven all day, and it being the middle of the night, my father had the idea of pulling off to the side of the road to sleep for a few hours, before waking up and finishing out the journey. Bear in mind, there were no rest stops on this highway, so it was either side of the road or nowhere to rest. My mother agreed, but maybe 20 minutes after stopping and trying to get sleep, my mother didn't feel comfortable and decided instead of sleeping here, she would drive while my father rested, and when he woke up, she would rest while he took over. Just to reiterate, this is a not so traveled highway, so there are no lights, and my parents are in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest city or town is miles away. Not a mile or two down the road, my mother notices something on the side of the road, and she gets closer, and notices it is just a single man in the middle of nowhere, with no lights or anything, just walking on the side of the road in the direction of where my parents were just parked. There were no broken down cars further up the road, and there was nothing in miles to justify why this man would be walking on the side of the road. My parents don't bring it up much, but they have wondered what would have happened if they both fallen asleep in their car on the side of the road that night. From 2012 to 13, I did a lot of hiking in and around the coastal range in Oregon. I frequently would go out by myself for days and come into town to restock on food if necessary. It was commonplace for me when I was in town, to spend the whole day hiking back the four hours to where I was camping at dusk. The trail I took wasn't well travelled, and looked more like a deer path than anything. I had chosen my campsite for its lack of foot traffic and its serenity, avoiding conventional locations. I had only a cell phone on me during this period of hiking and camping and no bright clothing. No GPS tracking device and or emergency beacon. Probably wasn't the smartest idea looking back. There were times that I heard and saw things while out in the forest that I didn't recognize by sight and or sound, but nothing came close to the incident I had in May of 2013. I had done my usual restock in a small town some six miles from where I had decided to camp for the night, and I spent the day in town as usual. I started walking back to my camp location about dusk. Half of the walk, I chose to use dirt roads until veering off on the deer trail I used earlier in the day. By this time, it was completely dark, but it was clear out and possible to see the trail still using the moonlight. I don't listen to headphones while hiking. I've always thought it's wiser to be able to hear whatever is around you, in case there is a predator, whether human, animal, or whatever. I was mentally doing some calculations for the next day's hike, when my mind is literally stopped mid-track. I hadn't heard anything, and I don't make hardly any sound when hiking. If I had heard something, I would have known. For some reason, be it a sixth sense or survival instinct, I'm not sure, I was jolted quite suddenly, out of thought, and very aware of the fact that I wasn't alone on this trail. What was odd to me especially, is even though I had heard nothing whatsoever, I knew acutely that something was behind me, specifically about 30 yards down the trail. I still to this day have so many unanswered questions about how I knew this, 
Standing really still, I turned around and looked down the trail. I didn't see anything, but I felt it. It honestly really is difficult to pin down how to describe what I felt, because I hadn't felt that way before or since. It was straight up fight or flight, and my logical mind was saying there's nothing out of the ordinary, while my senses were saying to get the hell out of there. Again, looking back and remembering this, I have no idea what to say. This is really hard to explain. It was like I was being taunted, and I felt it. The presence of something, or someone, was down the trail. And for some reason, I knew that it knew that I knew it was there, even though I couldn't see it. That's what still scares me to this day. It knew, and it was bright enough for me to see down the trail 30 yards back no problem. There wasn't anything on the trail, and I will swear by it. It was like I was being taunted, or beckoned to come closer. This was maybe 30 seconds into looking down the trail, if that. I was panicking, but I still wasn't sure what to think, because I still wasn't seeing anything threatening. So I turned around and started walking at a quick pace. I didn't know what else to do. I knew that if in fact a guy was out to kill me, he was probably going to end up killing me. On this trail, or in my tent after following me back to it. So why run was my logical thought. I would say that I wasn't even a minute into the trek back, that I heard what can only be described as a sound like rushing or swooping air, followed by what seemed like a rake sliding across the dirt trail. The former sound happening right after the latter. These sounds happened together, like half a second apart, four times. And they were very close, maybe 20 yards back. Looking back now, I don't know how I was able to stay composed and not soil myself. But somehow I mentally stayed focused on getting back to my tent, ignored the panic, and just kept walking quickly, not looking back. Whoever or whatever it was, still followed me the majority for the next hour. I just kept heading onwards and didn't look back. A few minutes from my camp location, the fight or flight feeling gradually but succinctly left, and I crawled into my tent and didn't sleep a minute the entire night. Morning came, I picked up my stuff and left. It was the first Tuesday of the Pennsylvania deer season, December 3rd, 2013. I've always been an avid hunter and I would wake up very early in the morning to get into the woods before daylight. I would be in the woods by 4.30 in the morning, having to hunt on state game lands, meant beating other people into the woods to get a decent spot. When I got to the parking area at around 4.15, no one else was there. So I walked into the woods, not using a flashlight, but walking only by moonlight. I walked through a field into the tree line and started on my path to my spot. I came to an intersection in the path. One way went left and down the mountain. The other way went right. I went right because my spot was on the other side. Roughly 50 yards after making the right hand turn, I smelled what I can only describe as hot garbage. It hit me in the face. Like I mean, hot dumpster juice in the middle of August. So I stopped dead, turned on my flashlight, expecting to see piles and piles of garbage. Nothing, no garbage, nothing dead. Just hot garbage smell. Keep in mind this is in December. It's cold out, high 20s to low 30s. 
So even if there was garbage, it shouldn't smell that bad. So I kind of thought nothing of it. I followed the path to my spot, which was down over the ridge from the garbage smell. Roughly maybe 40 feet down, that leads into a grass field where I would sit. I set up my seat, get settled in for about two minutes. That's when rocks started coming down the ridge. The first rock startled me, causing me to turn on my light again, scanning the field, hoping to see eye reflection of a deer, but nothing was there. I sat back down. Another rock comes down the ridge. This time I stand up and go out into the grass field with flashlight and the pistol that I carry while hunting. I scanned again, nothing, and purposely waited in the field for about five minutes. Now I'm getting angry, assuming another hunter is messing with me because I'm in their spot. I sit down again. The third rock sounding larger than the others comes tumbling down the ridge. I don't get up this time. Not two minutes after that, another rock, not tumbled, but sounded as though it were thrown off the ridge and landed in the field. Screw it. I'm pissed. I gathered up my gear and started back up the trail to the ridge. I get on top of the ridge, scanning with my light the whole time. Nothing. No eyes. No other hunter. I get to the spot where I smelled the hot garbage. Nothing. The smell is gone. Finally, it clicked in my head. It may have not been another person, possibly something else. I've heard other stories of people's Bigfoot experiences, a lot of which remark on how bad the smell is. Screw that. I all but ran out of the woods, and to top it all off, no other vehicles were in the parking area when I got out of the woods. This took place in Pennsylvania State Game Lands 229, outside of Tremont, in Shoyukil country. I later come to find out that a co-worker of mine had actually seen a bipedal cross in front of his car within two miles of my location, so maybe they're real. I don't know. But I definitely had an experience that I will not forget. I went quail hunting about 10 years ago with my stepdad and his friend. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere next to Colorado River on the California side. We thought we were alone and one night we hear this girl screaming in the distance. It startled us. So we grabbed our shotguns and walked towards the screaming. We rolled up on this camp about a quarter of a mile away. And it's this guy, and we presumed his girlfriend. She is visibly distraught. He about craps his pants when three guys roll up with shotguns. He asks if everyone is okay, and she was looking at the ground and said she was fine, and that they were having an argument. The next morning we wake up at 4am to start the day's hunt, and we walk past their camp to check on them again. They're gone. We never heard them leave. I hope that girl was okay. This happened to me just a few days ago. My wife and I were backcountry camping in Redwoods National Park in California. And as we went to sleep, a heavy fog rolled in. I was sleeping soundly in the tent, but at around 3 a.m. I woke up suddenly with a sense that something was outside the tent. I heard the sound of light, muffled footsteps, and a quiet hissing or whispering sound, almost like something was muttering to itself. Assuming it was a bear or raccoon, I gently unzipped the rainfly of my tent and looked out. As soon as I opened the tent, the muttering sound ceased. The fog was so thick, I could barely see more than 15 feet away. The moon and the night sky weren't visible at all. I turned on my headlamp to get a better look, and in the distance I see a faint light turn on as well. At first, I thought it might be another hiker, 
although we were about 15 miles out and in the back country. But it was a yellowish slash orange flickering light only a couple of feet off the ground. I see a silhouette of a humanoid shape that almost looks like it's beckoning to me. I grab my knife, get out of my sleeping bag, and walk into the night. As I approached the light, I could see the humanoid shape more and more clearly, but I started to get really unnerved. It doesn't move. It doesn't make any noise. Who or what would be out here at 3am 15 miles into the woods? I turned once to look back at my tent, and when I turned back around, the light was gone. The next morning, we searched the area, the area where I saw the light, but we didn't see any tracks. The thing that scared me the most, though, is that right near where the light was, there was a 50-foot cliff leading into the stream below. I grew up on the New Mexico Reservation. I'm white, and my stepfather is Navajo. Anyway, it's really rocky desert and a mountain-like area, like the Grand Canyon, but smaller. No white people go out there. The Navajos back there and then really hated white people. You can walk all day and never see anyone. I was on my horse hunting and came to this circle-like depression in the sandstone and sand, like someone had made it a long time ago. There was no sound from animals around it. No lizards on the rocks, no birds humming. It was scaring the crap out of my horse. He was screaming and jumping and kicking, and I couldn't get him to calm down. So I got away from there and tied him up to a pinion tree in sight. I went to check it out with a weapon, of course. It was just a big circle about a foot deep, and it looked like something was built there but very long ago. I came back with friends and with horses and dogs. The horses did the same things, and the dogs just stayed on the top of the hill whining. No one had any idea what it was, but when we told our parents, we were told to stay away from it. The only thing I could find out was that the Navajos and other Indians would put people and children who could not contribute to the tribe in a pit-like circle to die from the elements. A long time ago, if you were crippled or mentally challenged, and couldn't hunt or farm, no one was going to support or take care of you. In the early 70s and 80s, growing up, I had hours of chores every day, even though I was going to school too. Exploring out there was amazing, and I've seen things that no one would believe. I was walking into a spot where I duck hunt. It had snowed several days before and had frozen and thawed a few times. So there was a really thick crust on the snow. I'm a big guy and could easily walk on top without breaking through. As I walked along a farm path, I heard something in the forest to my right. Looking, I noticed a shape maybe 30 yards away, trying to hide behind a tree line. I could see it clearly. It kept sliding to the left and peering around the tree trunk. I stopped and turned towards it, and it turned and ran away downhill, crossed the upper end of the frozen beaver pond, breaking through the ice, crossed an open field on the other side and disappeared into the woods. I lost sight of it before it broke through the ice. It scared me. Shaking, I drew my pistol and made my way back into the field on the far side of the beaver pond and looked at the muddy tracks where it came out of the water. There were just smudges. It wasn't even denting the packed forest snow. I went down to the water and looked at the broken ice. It was thick enough for me to stand on, and I tried. I went back to the tree that I was trying to hide behind, and there was a limb that was across its face, so I knew I could get a height estimate. That limb was even with the top of my head when I was standing, where it had stood. I'm six foot, 
so this thing must have been at least six foot six or taller. What was it? It was bipedal, standing at six foot six. Maybe it was a person. What could possibly make a human cross a frozen pond in cold 10 degree Fahrenheit weather, not knowing if the ice would support them or not, or even how deep the water was? Then, when did this now very wet person go in a 300 acre forest? There is still a logical explanation. I just don't know what it is. I do a fair amount of archery hunting when the weather permits, and trap rabbits about three times a year, although I do release them if they're pregnant. I used to be a vet technician and just can't do with baby bunnies. But I think the craziest thing that ever happened was when I was following some deer tracks. I had been tracking the herd for a few days, not planning on bagging one, just to observe. So I'm hauling around a tree stand and my tent and bare essentials. Before my pup got cancer, I would bring her, but she's in chemo, so it was a solo trip. I generally let her tell me when I wasn't noticing something, but without her, it got fairly creepy pretty quickly. I notice I'm losing the light and rub my face in frustration. And I'm suddenly waking up. I was just laying down, with my tent and everything set up. Firewood under me, ouch, and a rip in my jacket. Nothing else to show for it, except that it was way darker than before. I check my watch. I've got roughly three hours to sunrise. When slash who set up my tent? They did it differently than I normally did. Okay, it's kind of just oilcloth and rope, and I travel light but it wasn't in my usual formation. The zippers on my pack were all open. I was grasping my sheathed field blade in my left hand, and I'm right-handed. I don't know what happened. To this day, it unsettles me. One winter, when I was homeless in college, I had a mouse crawl into my tarp hideout, as it was pouring buckets. It practically swam to get under the tarp, and it just sat there gasping, shivering. I gave it a cracker, and it sat with me. I eventually fell asleep for a few hours. When I woke, it was gone. But a little pile of grass and a twig with a berry on it, poisonous unfortunately, was where the mouse had been. Kinda always thought of it as a thank you. I was stalked by a mountain lion once. It was the late 90s, and I will never forget the feeling of being potential prey. My boyfriend at the time and I wanted to hike in this area, in the desert, called Hellhole Canyon. Despite the name, it was a gorgeous place to hike, but far into the desert. It was early spring because the plants were still green, and there was water running in the stream later in the year because everything dies up and turns brown. It had just rained too, because there were rain puddles on the trail. I saw a big print. It looked like a large dog, but no claws. Keep in mind that just like house cats, big cats have retractable claws. So that told us to be careful. But we continued to hike because it was a loop trail. Just when we got to the part of the loop that was the furthest from the trailhead, I bent down and saw some tiny paw prints that looked just like the others, except little. I started gushing about how cute they were and that the babies must be somewhere. Then we heard the growl. It sounded almost like a rumble engine, like dirt bikes or something off in the distance. But it was not a dirt bike, and it was close. All of a sudden I realised that the birds that were previously chirping around us were dead silent. I stood up, and took off my backpack to hold it above my head to make myself look larger, and told the boyfriend that we were leaving now. He heard the same thing, so he was already looking for a rock. 
there weren't any good hiking sticks in the area. Neither of us saw the animal, but we knew she was there. We both got big and made loud noises and walked away as quickly away from there as possible. I kind of think that if the mama cat wasn't busy with her new kittens, or if I were hiking alone, we would have been live bait. It's part of the reason I don't ever hike alone, ever. It's too easy to get caught by animals that usually leave people alone, if there is more than one. I work as a broadcast engineer, and a few years ago, I received a phone call at around 9.30 slash 10 p.m from the on-duty engineer that our over-the-air signal had gone out and we were off the air on our over-the-air platform. We figured out that the problem was at our transmitter and needed to be corrected manually. My boss asked for someone to volunteer to go with him and after a few seconds of awkward silence, I offered. So, our RF transmitter site was located on top of Beacon Mountain in Beacon, New York, which was about an hour plus from our station. At the time, I had never been up there, so going there in the middle of the night was a little spooky. I met my boss and we drove together and got to the mountain a little before midnight. The road up the mountain to the transmitter site is a long, narrow, windy, and steep dirt road with a lot of big, loose rocks, so the drive up and down is scary enough. I can't emphasize enough how dark this drive was, like pitch black. A few times while going up, we could see headlights coming towards us of people with their off-road jeeps which wouldn't be as weird if it wasn't in the middle of the night. We also saw two different campfires in the woods, which I just assumed were local groups hanging out and drinking. My boss told me that locals hung out near the transmitter site sometimes and should be avoided as they had a tendency to be sketchy. Didn't seem too sketchy to me, but what did I know? It was my first time there. My boss also told me that he never travels to the mountain without a gun. He said it's more than the locals. I've seen stuff out there I really can't explain. We get to the top, do our work on our transmitter, close everything up, and start to head back down. As we're heading down, we were at a particularly steep part of the road, when you pretty much have to ride your brake because the car won't stop until the incline levels are out a little. All of a sudden, three deer sprint out in front of us, not even looking at our oncoming car, causing us to swerve since we were already riding the brake. The front of the car hit a rock, which stopped our momentum. My boss instantly turned off the car, and once the sound of the engine died, we heard something big run in the opposite direction away from the road, up the natural slope of the hill. I shined my flashlight in that direction, but whatever it was, was already out of sight. We could still see branches moving and leaves settling from being disturbed by whatever ran away. I asked my boss if he thought that was another deer, or possibly a bear. He replies, bears run on all fours. Whatever that was, ran on two legs. And bears don't hunt deer. Something was chasing them. When we first heard the footsteps, I would estimate that they were as close as 10 to 15 feet from the car when it started to run away, but appeared to be standing over us as if there was a natural incline up the mountain. There are a lot of logical explanations like that my boss was trying to scare me, or that it was a local walking slash running through the woods. 
But here are a few things to consider. Yes, it could have been a person walking alone through the woods. But why chase deer? And why run away from the car? Also, whatever ran away was out of sight quickly, within three to four seconds running uphill. This person would have had to have been in the greatest shape ever to run up the hill that quickly. This also sounded way too big to be a bobcat, mountain lion, or coyote. My boss is not the kind of guy that would try to scare people. He's a very stern or business type of guy. He seemed pretty rattled by this and wanted to get off the mountain ASAP. I ended up going back up that mountain many more times before leaving for a new job, and I never saw or heard anything like that night. However, I never went back after sunset. I no longer work for this company, and this company no longer owns the transmitter site, so I will likely never have a reason to go back. I don't know of any reported sightings or experiences in the area, but I do know that over the years there have been many car accidents on the road. I assume all the accidents are due to the poor conditions of it, but honestly, I have no idea. Stories of the Alaskan Bushmen, or Tornets, have been told since the first humans crossed the Burring Land Bridge. In the beginning, the story goes the Inuit and Tornets lived peacefully in villages near each other and shared common hunting ground. The Inuit people often built and used kayaks for hunting, while the Tornets were unable to master the building of kayaks. They were very aware of the advantages of having and using one. One story goes that a young Tornit borrowed a young Inuit's kayak without permission and damaged the bottom of it. The young Inuit became very angry and stabbed the Tornit in the nape of the neck while he was sleeping, killing him. The rest of the Tornits feared that they too would be killed by the Inuit and fled the country, rarely to be seen again. Since that time, many stories have come out of the bush of hunters disappearing, later found dead and mangled, or never seen again. Apparently, hunters and the Tornets no longer peacefully shared common ground. Every spring, my family and the Panillo clan, a Hawaiian family we were very close to, would pack up and head to Willow for a week to fish for salmon in the Deshka and Little Sustina rivers. One particularly rainy and cold spring, my father, brother and I were pulling in salmon after salmon when a nasty, skunky, musty smell floated towards us. It suddenly dawned on me that most of the other fishing families had quietly and quickly disappeared. Mr. Panillo always fished with a shotgun by his side. My own father was always armed with a Colt .45, and now he unsnapped the holster and quietly told us to reel in our gear and pack up. Since we'd only been fishing for about an hour, and it wasn't anywhere near dark, all of us kids were a little bit confused. But knowing not to question our dads when they gave us an order, we did as we were told. I whispered to my dad asking what was wrong. He whispered back, bear. But I wasn't so sure. I had never smelled a bear like that. As we were crossing over the railroad bridge, I remember looking at some trees that had been uprooted and then stuck in the ground upside down. I often wondered why and how someone could do that. I learned many years later that it was a telltale sign of Bigfoot territory. I guess I'll never know if it was a bear or a Bigfoot that displaced us all from fishing that evening. But I do know that it was the last time our families ever fished that river. It was also the first and only time 
all the kids got to sleep, or at least tried to, in the camp trailer instead of the tents. When I was younger, I used to horseback around Northern California for weeks at a time. This was during the late 70s and early 80s. I rarely used a compass, but I always had a map of my area. I'm pretty good at dead reckoning via landmarks. I've never been lost in my life, except once. I was in the Six Rivers National Forest, heading south towards Trinity County. This is very rough terrain. Lots of high ridges, steep hills, and rocks everywhere. A nasty brush to tangle you. I was riding the ridges, heading generally south, and trying to find easy places to cross to the next ridge when it became convenient. The skies were partially cloudy, and it was a cool 60 Fahrenheit cold for that time of year, since it was early August, and the temperatures usually lingered around 90 Fahrenheit plus during the day. I found a reasonable spot to cross over the next ridge, south of me, and started down. When I got into the ravine, it turned out that what looked easy from above was actually a rocky nightmare. I started walking up the ravine, to find an easier place to get out of there. A wind picked up, and it started drizzling. I walked for a mile or so, and couldn't find anything that I wanted to risk my neck on, or more importantly, my horse's hooves, and decided to start up the side I had come down originally. I got to the top, took a look around to orient myself, and froze in shock. The landscape was completely different. I don't mean that it was lower or easier or less rocky. I mean that all of my landmarks were gone. Some of them were peaks that were 30 to 40 miles away. Others were a lot closer. It was completely different. I had no idea where I was, and I was completely disoriented. I dug up my map and started to review where I was the angles on the hills I had been navigating earlier. I couldn't find anything that matched. The only thing that I could possibly identify were the route up from the ravine that I had just come up. Since it was cloudy, I couldn't navigate by the sun. All I had were the landmarks that I used for dead reckoning, and those were gone. The wind was picking up, and it was getting very cold. I almost expected snow. I had no idea where I was, so I decided to backtrack to my last known position and see if I could pick up where I left off. I started down the hill, got to the bottom of the ravine, and started the opposite direction up. This time I was very careful, watching for signs of my passage before, and the hill I came down in the first place. It stopped raining. The wind died down, and the day started to warm up. I found my original trail down the hill, started back up, and I got to the top. All the landmarks were there now. I was totally confused. I kept going on the ridge, watching carefully to find where I had come up before. When I got to the spot where I thought it should be, there was no sign of it. I cast back and forth for a while, trying to find my trail with no success. All of my landmarks were there to see. Eventually I gave up, and continued on the ridge. A bit later, I found an easy trail down and an easy trail back up to the other side, and continued on my way. To this day, I still have no idea what happened. Even though it was drizzling, I should have been able to see those landmarks closer. And honestly, the further landmarks were big enough to see. To that point, thinking back on it, there was no sign that it was drizzling when I continued to where I had ascended the first time, and the temperature swings were wild that day, easily 30 to 40 Fahrenheit. 
It's not uncommon in the mountains, but really odd for that time of year in the first place. Another thing. Originally, I had chosen to descend at that point because there was nothing to prevent me from going up on the other side. I could see easily from the ridge top, but when I arrived, there were tons of boulders blocking me that I should have been able to see from the top. Eerie and creepy at the time, for sure. But I was more focused on trying to orient myself, but thinking back on it now, even more so. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains, not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which I think was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of that little road except our campsite. We parked at the entrance to the park and spent the day hiking up the site, setting up camp and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner and turned in. Not long afterwards, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored loudly. Like the walls of the tents began to shake snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or hour and a half, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school radio station and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up the main road where the reception was better and where we could actually be able to hear the radio over the snores. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to the site. As soon as we stood there, a black pickup truck with its lights off appeared out of the woods and passed by us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her move through the leaves towards the tent, coming from my right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window of the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and ducking behind it, as the black truck pulled into our campsite, still with its headlights off and just shut off its engine. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent and I know my two other friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, no bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it was a clear night and we can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet away from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sound as the engine cools off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent and I could hear her breathing that she was terrified but neither of us said a word. It feels like a really long time went by. It had to have been at least 10 minutes, but could have been half hour or more. 
We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck started again, and then backed up down the long, narrow dirt road. It never turned its headlights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy crap. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning as we planned. And yes, we checked with the park. They did not own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did a ranger come to check on our site in the night. So I had decided to go out looking for some mushrooms, the edible kind. I was probably about 20 miles on a back road, which is just a dirt road marked as a trail XYZ here. I found an out of the way spot to park my vehicle, where I know some good mushroom hunting can be found. After a little searching in a ravine, I found a good spot and set up a tent and built a basic campfire. I was out there two days before the incident. On the third morning, I got up to nature's call and walked off a bit to relieve myself. It was still pretty early, dawnish. I about tripped on this rock, and it was huge. I didn't remember seeing it there when I went to set up camp. I got an odd feeling, because there were similar sized rocks all touching each other. The reptile part of my brain was screaming. So I went and got my flashlight to check out these rocks. They formed, as far as I could tell, a perfect circle around my campsite. From memory, I'd say it was about a 15 to 20 foot diameter ring. I paced it off. The thing is, I could barely make these rocks budge. Sure, I could lift one, maybe just a few inches, but move them? No. They were about knee high. Some of them had to be in over a hundred meter range. In a moment of crystal clarity, I realized that if crap hit the fan, my vehicle would be found, but I wouldn't be. I don't think I've broken camp quite so quickly. I didn't even get the few mushrooms I had collected. I figured it would be better to leave them for whatever left me the ring of stones. I was such deeply troubled by this that I have not spent one night in the woods in the five or so years since this happened. A lot of people think I'm making this up, but it happened. I have my theories as to what it was. One, I can't talk about, because it has to do with Native American beliefs, of which I am one. But the other I will. As far as I know, Sasquatch has never been sighted in my area. I mean, we have the Fouke monster, but that's a couple of hours south of me. I've heard some stories when I was younger around the hunting campfire that there is something big living in the mountainous parts of Arkansas. These were old men telling the story 20 years ago. They say in turn that they saw the creature or heard them in their youth. One even talked about hearing roaring around his hunting cabin and a loud crash. The next day, most of the young trees had been splintered or pulled up. So I 100% believe that there is something out there. So to start off, let me say that I am naturally jumpy. I'm really wary of my surroundings. I'm not a quiet or shy person trying to avoid people. I do, however, feel like I have a great sense of when someone's wrong or strange and will try to avoid it. I'm from a country in Europe where the murder or crime rate in general is very rare. So you can imagine that people aren't afraid to walk around alone. However, I rarely go out by myself at night just because I'm from a small town and the surrounding woods creep me out. 
When I'm with friends, however, I do enjoy the night strolls. So last week, me and my best friend went on our usual walk. We know the roads really well. We walk the same path every time, and together we have a lot of fun. So we never think about scary things that could happen. The first three quarters of our path is well lit by street lamps, and there are houses around. Not a lot of them, but they're there. Then we arrive at the tunnel, and from then on there are no lights, and the asphalt road turns into a rocky slash pebble one. When we get to that spot, a white van is standing in front of the tunnel, to the side of a ditch that runs there. It's not turned on, and we're quite creeped out by it, but we just joke about how someone is going to follow us. When we pass, I mention that I thought I saw the silhouette of someone inside, but my friend gets angry at me for scaring her. After we cross the tunnel, the path turns left, and you have to walk uphill. It's not a long or hard walk before you come on top of that hill and have to go down again. From that point on, you are surrounded by woods on one side, and with open hop fields on the other. It's really dark, but we continue having a fun conversation for about five minutes or so, before the lights of something start shining from behind us, as there are a lot of farms about a mile or two ahead. So we move to the side and continue walking in order to let the car pass by. However, we look back and realize that it is not a car, but in actual fact, the white van from before. We kind of freaked out, but were hoping it would just pass. It didn't. We kept walking slowly for 50 to 100 meters, and the van is slowly trailing behind us. When we speed up, we hear it rev up as well, and when we slow down, the vehicle does the same. I nudge my friend on the shoulder, look straight at her in the eye and say, run to the field on the left, now. We both make a run for it as fast as we can, and we almost trip on the piles of soil because there are lots of them in the hot fields. We finally jump down and hide behind one of the bumps on the ground and wait. The van stops, turns on the strong headlights, and two men exit. They have hoods on, and they're each holding flashlights shining in our direction, scanning the fields. I think a minute or so passes, before they get back in the van, turn it around on the spot, and drive back from the direction we came from. We've never been this freaked out, and we just ran home through the field. The houses started again right by the end, so we felt safe when we got there. I don't know who these people were, and I've never been followed like this before, but I think we're going to be staying off the paths for quite some time now. In September this year, I was hunting antelope out near the Red Desert in Wyoming. I had just shot my antelope, and was walking about 150 yards out to where it had dropped, so I could tag and begin field dressing the animal. I should mention I'm about 40 miles from the main road, and that I had not seen another human or vehicle since I got off the main road. This area is extremely remote. It's hard to even describe. So as I'm walking out to the antelope, I look up, and about one to two miles off in the distance, I see this extremely bright light zooming over the landscape and heading my way. I thought it was probably a game warden on a side-by-side -side coming to check my paperwork and all. No big deal. I keep walking out and find the animal, and look up, and this light drives down into the sagebrush, and I can no longer see it. It was about half a mile from me when it disappeared. I also notice I don't hear any engine, if it is in fact someone on a motorized vehicle. I'm mostly confused at this point, not sure what the hell this light is, 
or where it went, but I continue on and tag the antelope. It takes me all of 10 to 15 seconds to put the tag on. Then I look up and see the light traveling away from me. It's now about three to five miles away from me and going at at least 100 miles an hour. It was really zooming way faster than any vehicle could travel over that type of terrain. Also, there are no roads or anything where the light is traveling. So I don't know how it was going so fast. I'm pretty spooked at this point. I field dress the animals as fast as I can and drag it back to my truck. I just had a very uneasy feeling at this point. I have no idea what that light was, although some others have speculated that it was a drone. But if it was a drone operated by the game warden, why did he come to check me out once I got back to the truck? Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's Walk in the Wood, the very first of many podcast episodes. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to go over and check out our YouTube channel, where I post new stories every night. But with that being said, I hope you all have a safe night, and I'll see you in the next one.